Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of ESG Climate and Money Show. Today, uh, we will continue on the engagement discussion. Uh, as you may have noticed in last two episodes, we have been digging more deeper and deeper into the engagement activities conducted by investors uh, and also for the energy sector and overall for the ESG well-being in the long run. And now today, I am going to present you with a, uh, like kind of a new approach to the engagement activities. And uh, so our guest today is Richard and Richard come from a startup, which is actually doing engagement activities in with the investors. So uh, please, uh, Richard, introduce yourself. Welcome to the show. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you, Sonny. It's uh, great to be on the show. So I'm glad for, for you having me. Um, yeah, so my name is Rickard. I, uh, currently, I work at a startup called Eskaya. So essentially, what we do is a engagement management system for investors, right? So that they can improve and optimize their engagement process. Today, a lot of investors would use Excel as sort of the incumbent to structure their uh, their dialogues in a spreadsheet for oversight, for sort of coordination within their organizations. However, I would say that today there are better ways of doing that, right? So doing sort of helping investors by, by providing a purpose-built engagement management software, which is cloud-based that enables better coordination, transparency and oversight within uh, investor organizations makes a lot of sense. So that's sort of where I'm, where I'm at at the moment. Um, in terms of my background, I come from the uh, responsible investing space. I've been in the in the industry for for several years. Um, used to work at one of the big uh, ESG research providers before I joined Eskaya. Um, they also had their like engagement as a service offering, right? Where they had a bunch of engagement managers driving dialogue for investors. Um, so I used to work with the development of that offering in the last couple of years. Um, so I've gained a lot of sort of insight into active ownership and investment stewardship. But now then come fall last year, I chose to join as Gaia to, to also help with uh, implementing technological capabilities and systems for investors to use. So that's on short on my background, Sonny. That's quite nice, uh, Richard. And uh, now the other thing is that this is uh, such a huge topic, as you, you know, this engagement. And uh, there are two groups which are saying like engagement is failing and one group in the ESG industry saying maybe it's not failing. Uh, just give it some time. What do you think? Like, what is the status of this uh, engagement activities? Uh, in the industry today, um, from based on your experience, how would you uh, kind of enlighten us with your answer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess, like taking a step back, I think it's important to acknowledge the sort of theory behind active ownership. So active ownership is essentially investors using their influence to influence uh, corporates, markets, and economies to become more sustainable, right? And they do this through using the, the engagement toolbox consisting of using shareholder rights through voting or engaging in dialogue, using public announcements and blacklisting, potential litigation, and so on and so forth. So that sort of constitutes that toolbox that investors would use, right? Um, and so currently what we know about active ownership is that it, it's sort of a trident in terms of what it can, can create for investors, right? So partly it's, it has this impact, uh, this mechanism of, of uh, impact. So based on the, the available responsible investing strategies that investors use, active ownership is acknowledged as the primary mechanism to drive impact and influence, at least in public or secondary markets. So it's a really useful tool from that perspective. We also know that active ownership and engagement can reduce downside risk. So reduce the risk in, in exposures that, that investors have in companies, as well as increase uh, returns for investors. So this makes the, <laughs> this makes 
active ownership a really compelling strategy to be used. And I would say that in terms of the status of the market right now, as it regards how effective or not it is, we do certainly need to acknowledge that the investor community has done a lot. Like there's been a lot of progress within engagement. Historically, we have a lot of sort of successful examples of where it has worked or where investors have engaged uh, on public policy and, and have really sort of helped shape the future of the market and where we're going. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to acknowledge that there are a lot of severe ESG issues and systemic risks out there that the community has been unable to, to sort of respond to or, or solve together as a community between investors, corporates, the wider and broader society as such as well. And in that, yes, active ownership needs to become more effective in order to not become illusory. Uh, we need to acknowledge that there is a green that there is greenwashing going on for sure. I mean, investors also use it because it may make it simpler for them to say that they don't need to spend the same same sort of resources on on ESG and responsible investing in general because they say, hey, we engage in dialogue with these with our portfolio companies. But if you really look under the hood, what you would then see is that the the strategy, the process, the resources aren't really there. It ends with sort of a fact-finding dialogue, asking a couple of questions to the corporates and calling that engagement. And that's not really what purposeful engagement is about in terms of really trying to influence corporates to change objectives or milestones and following up on progress over time. So there are, I would say, different mechanisms and, and the, the, the sort of how the market works currently that, yes, we acknowledge the progress that has been made, but we also need to acknowledge that we need to evolve as an industry, also in terms of active ownership. Absolutely, it's um, thank you for uh, thank you for being honest. I would say uh, the, the there is another thing. It's like uh, it, it there was some paper they were saying like uh, even these uh, engagement services, these organizations are understaffed. Uh, to really do the proper proper engagement activities, and of course the there is also the the the, the greenwashing aspect, uh, not necessarily from them, but overall in the space is uh, still there, and it's completely, completely kind of uh, yeah completely understandable in a way, but uh, given the given the very you know, given the status that this industry is still a bit new. Uh, in a way, and the scrutiny will keep on increasing uh, going forward. But uh, what do you think, um, what are really the kind of, uh, if I say you uh, two main challenges uh, going forward, and what could be the potential uh, solution to these uh, challenges, well, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think like we can separate challenges in terms of what investors can actually manage today within the organization, as well as some of the broader sort of market barriers that we see uh, within active ownership. So I guess one challenge within investor organizations is really the, the lack of resources or, or skills to drive purposeful engagements. In the ESG space today, uh, responsible investing, uh, human capital and, and resources, it's quite hard to get your hands on. Given the, the sort of immense growth of the industry recently, uh, and as you say, it's quite a young industry, actually, if you, would, if you would look at it from that perspective, 25 years or so, but still, it's really sort of picked up speed in the, in the last couple of, you know, five to 10 years. Um, but that also means that, that the industry knowledge and expertise, we still need more resources and more personnel to really deal with this, right? And that certainly makes also um, the, the, when it comes to active ownership, that given how complex like the markets are and, and how companies operate, in order to drive purposeful dialogue and really be able to discuss with companies, you know, 
strategy and governance issues and how companies are planning for the future and really setting them up towards, for example, aligning with the net zero pathway or having these sort of very intricate dialogues about corporate strategy, CAPEX, OPEX, and all of these things, you need seniority, right? And currently, I do think that a lot of investors are, are missing that piece. Um, you also see this trend where investors... Uh, or their investment teams are, are increasingly uh, demanded that they should also do active ownership, right? However, that's sort of another task that they should be doing, right? Uh, um, throughout their sort of their full uh, time that they spend. And that's not, that's not easy either because they don't come with that sort of, at least the ESG knowledge from before. They might be used to engaging corporates on more governance or, or financial related matters, but at the same time, they don't have sort of that ESG toolkit or, or expertise needed, right? So then you have these two forces that you need to work with where the ESG teams oftentimes come in with the subject matter expertise to help and, and sort of coordinate efforts together with the, the investment teams. Um, but in that... Yes, we also need to acknowledge that we need the, the right kind of resources to do this. And I think many investor organizations simply don't have that at the moment. So I think that was a, a long answer to one challenge, but I would add then a second challenge uh, if we talk about sort of market barriers, uh, certainly the lack of transparency in the market. So again, the engagement toolbox, we have different kinds of activities. And on the voting side, we do have transparency on sort of voting records and voting insights of how investors have voted on company X, Y, and Z and so forth. But engagement dialogues are sort of more intangible than voting, right? Oftentimes they are open-ended. It's about sort of a long-term relationship that builds over time. And that way you use dialogue to partly to, to uh, update yourself on, on company financials, but then also to try and drive purposeful dialogue within different subjects. However, today in the market, there's no easy way to find how uh, different investors have engaged companies, either historically or at the moment, right? Yes, you do have competitive aspects in that, that, that investors want to hold that information for themselves. But I would say that with all of the ESG challenges that we face, I think we need to go beyond that because much of this sort of ESG related information is information that most investors would benefit from. And, and it's simply, you know, something that investors should, should be doing and be sort of disclosed in public so that we all can increase influence and accountability together. And, and so just to sort of end on, on this point here. So what this lack of transparency also means is that you get a lot of duplication effort, effort in the market, which is to no one's benefit. And you also get information asymmetry. So some investors sit on some, some information and others don't have access to the same kind of uh, information to take an informed you know, decision, which would sort of benefit the, the economy as a whole, but whereby you would have more sustainability sort of integrated in in the analysis and, and uh, dialogue going forward. So I think those are two quite big, big barriers. Uh, there are certainly more of them as well, Zoni. <laughs> yeah, but um, very, very nicely summarized uh, still, um, because there's a long list of challenges of, your, uh, of course. And th this resource part is also a huge thing as uh, somebody, there, there was some report that, that like, the financial industry spends uh, thirty-five billion dollars on uh, yeah. on these services, and like one to two billion dollars is being spent on this uh, ESG-related uh, data and knowledge. Yeah. So it's a it's a huge thing, and the capacity building, of course, uh, is a huge aspect. Of course, is is still less young people are working in these uh, these big. Um, uh, investment-related, uh, uh, like sovereign funds and, and all that. So it, it, it is a long way to go. And uh, I also agree with you that the overall, uh, in a way, the, the efforts are not really that sort of organized 
uh, and they don't really correlate to each other. People can do the two things um, repeatedly or several times over without actually measuring the effect. And this is one of the big challenge with the ESG space uh, in journal. But what do you think overall, like seeing the space from an engagement uh, perspective, what could be the potential or what are the, sh not the short term, but what could be the long term uh, solutions in terms of uh, like what is happening in the space to solve these things? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think that's what the industry is sort of battling at the moment, right? You've seen recent reports on sort of the future in, of engagement. There's a lot of discussion around the greenwashing mechanism and how we should really ensure engagement becomes more effective. I think a couple of things that I would point to is certainly that investors need to focus on quality and not, not quantity. So we all know, yes, depending on the investors, your resources and your, your size will differ, right? So you need to assess sort of who are your clients or end beneficiaries, what are their interests and what should we be focusing on? And given our profile, you know, size and resources and so forth, how can we then ensure that our the, 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 the resources that we can act, use for active ownership is is utilized in the best of ways, right? So focusing on quality, focusing on collaboration. So collaboration between investor organizations, partly bilateral, but also through collaborative initiatives, networks and so forth, so that we can increase influence and also decrease or minimize the cost of, of uh, you know, engaging through, through collaboration. And then second part, is, is public policy, right? So in terms of how investors work with, with active ownership, public policy advocacy needs to be a central part of that because evidently there are numerous sort of market failures at the moment when it comes to different kinds of issues. Climate change perhaps being the, the most prominent or evident one in the market, right? But to have sort of a loving playing field in which corporates can, can act along a net zero pathway whereby they are not sort of uh, hurt and by taking sustainability measures that do doesn't pay off because ESG pays sometimes and sometimes it doesn't, right? So in order to, to have a level playing field, we need po a policy environment that enables that. And so investors need to focus on also engaging with with policymakers and they would do that through public consultations being part of networks like the local SIFs, uh, sustainable investment forums that you have in many markets and so on and so forth so i think those are are really key parts of of what investors need to do um and perhaps i'll, I'll prolong that to to a third as well in terms of uh, what can happen and, and what i think that that the invest their community needs to focus on. And I think that will come back to one being like the internal capabilities, right? We talked about the technology piece. I think that there's much to be done to simplify and optimize work streams within, uh, within investor organizations. Uh, currently, when it comes to data management, it's a very siloed approach. They use... Uh, the investment teams sit in their RMS systems. Facts at Bloomberg, you have the ESG and RI teams might have internal ESG dashboards or, or use Excel or other kinds of tools to structure their, their responsible investment work. So you might have several different systems in play, which makes information access really hard, uh, makes the, the workflow quite inefficient and so forth. So I think there's a lot to be done uh, within that sort of, coordination piece as well um so so yeah i mean that's that's at least three points which i think uh, investors could benefit from focusing on mm. yeah very nicely put this this um tell us a little bit about your company what does your company do um can you walk us a little bit <laughs> into sure, that sunny. um so I started with sort of saying that we offer investors in ESG or engagement management platform and software. 
So that is essentially where we are at the moment. It really helps investors with both, you know, activity recording, progress monitoring of engagement activities over time, as well as the sort of stakeholder reporting back to both internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. So it's essentially a CRM system which helps investors to optimize the process. We use system integrations to link up with internal or third-party systems, so to optimize and optimize the workflow further as well. Uh, that's where we are at the moment, and certainly many investors would benefit from a system systems similar to this. Um, but I think where we are going to over the mid to long term is, is trying to create an engagement ecosystem. So that would entail partly, you know, having this management system, uh, which helps with the coordination within an investor organization. But we also want to build out functionality around external collaboration. So bilateral collaboration with, with other investors, but also for potential um, engagement initiatives to use the platform for their own coordination. Um, and then certainly there are ways we can also improve market dynamics around the relationship between investors and the com companies in turn. So it's in, in sort of creating an ecosystem like that, what it would entail is essentially that you need to use partnerships and technology to really get a solid uh, approach to this. Certainly, the, the, the collaboration part is, is the key. Uh, there is also this is a big thing. But uh, thank you for uh, offering us the introduction of your uh, uh, this company. And uh, if uh, some of the audience of this uh, podcast would like to contact you, uh, how can they do that? Yeah, sure. Um, they can reach me via email. I think we can include that in, in the session notes from, from this podcast. Um, they can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Rikke Nilsson. Uh, they can find me on, on Twitter as well. Um, Rikke Nilsson at, uh, or Dash Eskaya. Um, so yes, I would be happy to connect and also to discuss market practices more widely. Um, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Richard, for uh, today's uh, episode, appearing on this episode and uh, walking uh, us all through this uh, journey of ESG engagement. Uh, it, uh, it has been a pleasure. And uh, looking forward to sit together with you again sometime uh, later. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sonny. It's been, uh, it's been uh, great. So thanks a lot. Thank you again.